Good morning to everyone. That was just a pause right there to refresh, that's all. (laughs) And uh, good to see each one of you in the house of the Lord this morning. Really appreciate you being here. Trust that the worship service today will be a real blessing to you. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. I think probably... I didn't know this till a few minutes ago, but probably two colors are in order today. Green for St. Patrick's Day, and where's all the reds at? <laughs> you guys happy this morning? Rex is. I can see him back there. He, he's going like this. <laughs> all of you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, Oh, me. (laughs) Got to have a little bit of fun this morning. I think it's okay to do that and uh, uh, just enjoy the time while you can enjoy it. That's exactly right. Um, We welcome those that will join us later today by way of YouTube also and trust that their hearts will be blessed. And uh, may all of our hearts be blessed today. Good to have Brother Ken with us. I always appreciate him coming and sharing with us in the services. And uh, welcome him as well as all of you. Let's go together to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get the musical part of our service underway. And uh, just pray with me. Father, thank you for your blessings upon us. We are truly, truly grateful for all that you do in our lives. We're thankful for how you have provided in the week past. All of us have faced many different challenges and uh, through those challenges you have uh, kept us all safe, you've provided for us, you've enabled us to be here this morning. I know these wonderful folks join me in saying we are so grateful and so thankful. We ask that you bless the choir as they sing, bless the congregation, bless in the children's peace this morning, bless in all that we do. May the sermon today be one that warms and touches our hearts. To you be the praise, the honor, and the glory given for all that's done, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Darkness. 
you all have some green on this morning, and most people do, except for those celebrating the red. So what are we wearing green for, do you know? St. Patrick's Day, that's right. What do you think of when you think of St. Patrick's Day? Anything come to mind? Green, right? Well, I want to share with you something that came to mind for me for St. Patrick's Day. You like Lucky Charms? I like Lucky Charms a lot. So this is one of my favorite cereals and has been since I was a little girl like you guys. Um, I may have brought you some today to share, but before we do that, you like the marshmallows or do you like the crispy, crunchy things? I like the marshmallows too. He said, I like the marshmallows. <laughs> yeah, you like the marshmallows too? That's the best part, isn't it? And they've got all these fun shapes and colors. Well, I wanna share with you this morning something that you can think of when you see these shapes when you're eating the Lucky Charm cereal. You see the rainbow? You see the rainbow right there? That is a symbol of God's promises. That's what the rainbow means. That means that he's made promises and God never fails to keep his promises. The balloon, how many of you like balloons? Yeah, we like balloons. He lifts all of our burdens away from our shoulders. He takes all of our burdens away so we don't have to carry them. How about the heart? The heart means that God is ever abounding in love. He loves us more than anybody ever could. How about the star? <coughs> Did you know that God is so big that he knows the name of every star in the sky and he knows every name of every person in this room and in the whole wide world? That's how big God is. So he, names, he knows all the names of the stars and all the names of every person. The moon, the moon tells us that sorrow only lasts for the night. In Psalms 35, there is joy in the morning. So sorrow will only last through the night. The clover, how many of you have found a clover? Most of the time we find three leaf clovers, right? So the three-leaf clover stands for the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The horseshoe, well, today may be a celebration of luck, but with God, we don't need luck, do we? You don't need luck when you walk with God. And then lastly, the newest marshmallow they added, what in the world could the unicorn stand for? I bet you like unicorns. Yeah, you do too? The unicorn reminds us to be pure-hearted. That's what the unicorn stands for. So I hope you guys have enjoyed that. And while you're eating your Lucky Charm cereal, you can have that one, you'll think about those things when you pick out those marshmallows. Here you go. All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege to be in your house this morning and for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us throughout this past week. Be with us in the upcoming week. Be with those who couldn't be here with us this morning. Um, help us to remember all the blessings that you give to us each and every day and how thankful we are for those, Father. Thank you for all that you do, for it's in your precious name. Amen. I invite you to open your Bible with me this morning to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to look at uh, a few verses starting with verse 13, actually four verses that I'm going to read here for the basis of our thoughts this morning. We're going to launch a new series today that's going to take us on beyond Easter, but include it, of course, each and every week will uh, we'll be like stacking blocks one on top of the other as we build this series 
over the next uh, seven, eight weeks or so. I hope it will be meaningful to you. I call it the I Am series. And hopefully you'll find a very wonderful connection with Easter in association with this as we go forward. <clears throat> as you look at the title, I may not have used the the right English form, so if I didn't, you English majors, you forgive me. I probably should have said, whom do you say Jesus is? But I said, who do you say Jesus is? That's okay, you're in the South, right? Can I get away with that? <clears throat> um, but that's the title of today's lesson, to get us started. The foundation for this title comes from the book of Exodus. You don't have to turn there. I will uh, turn very briefly to Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, and just remind you that Moses has encountered the burning bush, and he is asking God about what he is to say whenever he goes to the children of Israel. Moses said unto God, verse 13, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. That's in all caps in my Bible. I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Hence, I have entitled this series, the I Am series. And as we go through it, we're going to see what Jesus says about himself, who he is. But we lead off today with the question that we all are confronted with, whom do we say individually that Jesus is? This first lesson in the series is one that raises some important questions for all of mankind. Every single person in this world encounters these questions at a point in time in their life. Notice as we pick up the reading in verse 13, Then Jesus, or when Jesus, came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah's, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The question that every human being faces is one that centers on who Jesus is. Who is Jesus? Answer that question correctly with a believing heart and we have the promise of living forever with the Lord Jesus Christ in the place that he has gone to prepare for us. And I certainly don't want to miss that, do you? I do not want to miss it for anything in this world. Answer that question incorrectly. And unfortunately, I must declare unto you today that anyone who does so will be eternally separated from the amazing and awesome love of Almighty God. There's just no other way to put it. I say it warmly, I say it lovingly, but I say it with absolute firm conviction that if a person does not know Jesus, they'll never see heaven. It's just that, uh, that's the bottom line, we might say. I want you to note these text verses very carefully. First of all, I share with you that Jesus asked his disciples what I would classify to be an impersonal question first. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Notice again verse 13, for he raises the question, whom do men say that I, the Son of God, am? Now let me give you a little bit of background information here that will be hopefully helpful to give you insight into him raising this question. If you were with us Wednesday night, you know we were talking about the beginning of the ministry of Christ and talking about how his ministry was conducted with tremendous humility and all that we know about of Christ removed pride out of the picture totally. He was an example of humility. So for a little over two years now, as of the point where we're reading in the scripture here, Christ has been conducting his earthly ministry. He began it at about the age of 30. I would uh, suggest that he's probably right close to 32 at the time that he is saying this. It's about a year, give or take a little, from the time that he went to the cross. And so here he brings the, the disciples together. He's been ministering now for... Uh, two plus years, whatever amount of time you might want to associate with it. And they have had an opportunity to see him do many things. Now we know that sequentially in the scriptures, there's many more things that he will do before uh, going to the cross. But up to this point that we're looking at here in what we find in Matthew He's already been doing a number of things. They have witnessed miracles that he has performed. They have witnessed his uh, wonderful teachings and so forth. But now there's something that's beginning to take place in the life of Christ himself. And I suggest unto you, I don't have chapter, I don't have book, I don't have verse to back up what I'm getting ready to tell you, but what I believe was beginning to occur within the mind of Christ, he was beginning to turn his attention toward Calvary. He knew what was out there in front of him. And so as he brings the disciples together here, he says unto them in a very impersonal way, I want you to tell me in my words what other people are saying about me and who they think I am. Whom do men say that I am? Many had heard about him. Most had an opinion of him, I'm certain of. Anyone who knew him had an opinion of him. If you know somebody, you have an opinion of them, right? We all form our opinions about people that we know. So people who had been in the presence of Jesus, who had heard him teach, who had seen him perform miracles, they had performed or developed opinions about him. And so Jesus said, what do men think about me, who I am? Tell me if you will. And so the disciples responded and they gave him four suggestions about who people were saying he was. Notice in verse 14, they said, some say you're John the Baptist. He had already put that to rest, right? He was not John the Baptist. Then secondly, they said, some say you're Elias, and that means Elijah, Elijah of the Old Testament. They say that's who you are. Others say Jeremiah, Matthew words it as Jeremiah's, but that's speaking of the prophet Jeremiah. So, Lord, here's what I'm telling you. They are saying that you are John the Baptist, or you are Elijah, or you are Jeremiah, and if you're not one of those, you're one of the other prophets. There's the four. You're one of the other prophets. Jesus heard what they had to say, but was their answer what Jesus was most interested in? I pause momentarily because I want you to think about that. 
was the answers that he received from them what he was most interested in. May I suggest to you that I don't think so. Because he comes right back in the very next verse, and he saith unto them, Whom, but whom say ye that I am? Whom say ye that I am? So, here's the second question of the Lord. This question is directed to them in a very personal way. Now, in the way that I read this, in the way I understand it, of those that were gathered with him there, his disciples on this occasion, the, the way he formulated this question and the way he asked it to them made it point directly to each and every one of them individually. Whom do ye say that I am? All right, John, whom do you say I am? All right, Peter, whom do you say I am? All right, and he, you, you could put each one of the disciples' names in there. Whom do you say that I am? They were, so to speak, put on the spot individually. Now, just picture the situation. The disciples with him, Jesus in their midst, looking and peering into their eyes like I'm looking into the eyes of each of you as I pan the congregation. And he says to them, but whom do you say I am? So Grayland, whom do you say the Lord is? Paula, whom do you say? And we could just go right around the room. Whom do you say the Lord is? Well, Peter being the man that he was, we think of him as being the most outspoken of the twelve, right? That's what we know about him. He a lot of times spoke before he thought. And sometimes he got himself in trouble by speaking before he thought. But he speaks very quickly, I think, here in response to the question of the Lord Jesus when he thunders out, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, Lord, that's exactly who I think you are. And that's my way of expressing who you are. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, those were powerful words given there in verse 16. What did Peter's response mean in light of biblical history? Well, here's what we need to know about that. In light of biblical history, what Peter was saying was something very, very important, important indeed, of tremendous value. The word Christ that is used here in the New Testament in the Greek is synonymous with the word Messiah in the Hebrew in the Old Testament. And so together, when you put Christ and Messiah, Messiah from the Old Testament, Christ from the New Testament, you bring them together in the one person that was addressing the disciples. Together, it meant that he was the anointed one. The anointed one. He knew, the Lord Jesus did, or Peter did rather, he knew that Israel was looking for the anointed one who would provide salvation to the nation. And so, as he looked back in the eyes of Jesus, he said, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. You are the anointed one. I believe that you are the one who has come to redeem Israel, God's chosen people, from their sin. So, in another way of expressing it, I would put it in these words. He was saying that Jesus was the one anointed by God to save those of Israel who would put their faith and their trust in Him. They didn't do that, of course, did they? And we'll study about that a bit later. <clears throat> Thirdly, I share with you this morning that the question of Jesus is also directed to each and every one of us here today in a very personal way as well. 
It is vital, I believe, with all of my heart for us to clearly understand who Jesus was, but not only who he was in the past, I think it is vital that we understand who he is today and what he means or should mean to each and every one of us. So you and I face the question of Jesus as he asks each of us individually, who am I to you? Who am I to you? Back to what I said just a few minutes ago. I realize that as we look at the world around us and think of what the world would say, there are many possible answers from the world's viewpoint. But may I suggest to you this morning that we need to forget all of those possible answers from the viewpoint of this world and come to this conclusion to realize that there are only two possible answers from God's point of view. Only two possible answers from God's point of view. Of the two possible answers from God's point of view, I will tell you up front, one is right, one is wrong. Let me tell you what the two possible answers are, I believe, from the viewpoint of God. Number one, A person could answer that question individually and say, well, let me put it like this in my own words. Jesus is just an ordinary man known to have been a part of history past. He was a good man. He did a lot of good things. But that's all he is. Do you know, folks, that there are multitudes of people in this world today who believe that Jesus is only a figure of past history? They believe that. They have been taught that. That there's no real significance to him in today's society other than to note and understand that he was a great figure of yesteryear that had a lot of influence on people and that influence has passed down through time. So did Confucius, so did any of the others that you could name. But there's a difference in this man. A great difference in this man. For those who answer the question, who is Jesus to you? Those who say Jesus is indeed the Messiah, God incarnate in the flesh, who died for our sins at Calvary and is now worthy of our complete allegiance after having received him as our own personal Savior. That's the right answer to declare in response to the question, who is Jesus to you? I believe that second answer is absolutely correct. That's the right one. I base my answer and belief on the words of Jesus himself that I find in the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I don't have time to go into all of the different things that Jesus said. So I'm just basically summing it up by saying, I believe what Jesus had to say about himself. Over the next several weeks, we're going to look at what Jesus had to say about himself, who he said he was. And I believe that he was every bit of what he said he was. I believe he is today. Every bit of that. So I hope you'll stay tuned for some exciting things that we will be talking about over the next few weeks. But as I close this morning with a few more things to say to you, I ask you this question once more time. How do you answer this most important question in your own life? I firmly believe with all of my heart this morning as I stand before you that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Christ, that Jesus is the 
incarnate Son of the living God. And I believe with all of my heart that He is my Savior and my soon coming King. And I'm looking for Him to come. In an earlier pastorate, we were taught a song. And the choir used to sing it, and I'd just rejoice. I'd get overjoyed by singing this song. It's the only church I've ever been in that I've ever heard the song sung. But the congregation knew that it was one of my favorite songs, and they would sing it and say, we're dedicating this to Pastor Joe. The title of the song, it was a song written by Jerome Davis, recorded by the Neelands, also, I think, recorded by Bill and Gloria Gaither, but it's a song entitled, I'm Glad I Know Who Jesus Is. And folks, I'm glad I know today who Jesus is. It goes a bit like this. In a little town called Bethlehem so many years ago, they told him there was no room in the inn, but they had no way of knowing who they had turned away, the Lamb of God who would take away their sins. Then you go into the course. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. He's more than just a story. He is the King of glory. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. Boy, we'd sing that and I'd put a smile on my face and down in my heart I'd just rejoice because I'm glad I know who Jesus is. Well, the song goes on. I won't bore you with me singing anymore. But let me tell you, Peter firmly believed in who Jesus was also. That's why he responded so quickly and so strongly. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. John records of Peter saying, We believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, in John chapter 6, verse 69. Let there be no doubt in your mind as you leave here today. Jesus is God made flesh. He is the I am of the New Testament and even said so in his own words. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. As recorded in John chapter 8, verse 58. You see, he connected what he was saying right there all the way back with the the words of God to Moses that I spoke of from Exodus chapter 3 a few minutes ago. He further clarified his words by saying in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. So if you say, well, when you look at Exodus, that was talking about God, God the Father. And in the New Testament, it's talking about Jesus and Jesus only. Well, let me just tell you something. You can just put the two together because he connected it up for us very well, very nicely by saying, I and my Father are one. And then he went further in verse 38 to say, The Father is in me, and I in him. That's who I am. And that's exactly who I am, and that's who he is. I am him, he is me. Vice versa, you can put it either way you want to put it. Yes, he is the invisible or the visible expression of the invisible God, that is the Lord Jesus. He is the visible expression of the invisible God. He is the revelation of God as recorded in John chapter 14, verses 7 through 9, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. Yes, He is God. He is the great I Am. As one preacher said, he put it in these words, and I quote him, don't know who he was, but I came across this saying, he said, Jesus is God spelling himself out in language that man can understand. That's a pretty good way of expressing who Jesus is. 
Jesus says to us today the same words spoken by his father in the Old Testament era and recorded by Isaiah the prophet in chapter 45, verse number 22. He says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for I am God, I am God and there is none else. Therefore, I conclude this, my beloved friends, this morning. Just as God is named the I Am, so is His Son, Jesus Christ. And He continued the revealing action of Almighty God as He lived here upon this earth and walked among men. And we beheld His glory, even the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Once more. Who is Jesus to you? You will have to answer that question someday if you haven't already. I hope you already have. But if you haven't, and you're here today, and for the first time in your life, you are confronted fully with who Jesus is, and you feel that need in your heart of receiving Him as your personal Savior, there wouldn't be a better time, a better hour, a better place than right here at Benham Baptist Church to walk down this altar, down to this altar, down this aisle to receive him. And I'll be here waiting with a smile on my face, I promise, if I can help you. Father, I pray that you will use this message for your honor and your glory. Speak to all of our hearts in the way that is most pleasing unto you. We give you praise, honor, and glory for being our Savior and for being who you are, for telling us in your word who you are. Easy for us to understand if we believe in the truth of God's precious word, and I do with all of my heart. So have your own way in this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please. Amen.